coming up on All Nations Trade. This is not political. Freedom is not political. Freedom is a God-given right. You want to be married? Great. How about burning those pornography magazines and deleting those obscene pictures you have on your laptop? You want to get out of debt? Great. Cancel your credit card and stop online shopping. <laughs> you want to have a baby? Prepare a room in your house. How many of you brought a Bible to church? Wave it up in the air, make the devil mad. Come on, I like it, that's it. Thank you, Jesus. Look at all those beautiful Bibles, amen? Thank you, Lord. Think about all the nations where you're not allowed to have a Bible, amen? So I think we need to uh, appreciate the gift we've been given, amen? So I'm starting a new message today called Fearless. And it's actually gonna be a three-part series. Uh, this week, I'm gonna be dealing on fearless faith. Uh, next week, fearless witness. And on Easter Sunday, fearless love. Amen? So, glory to God. Uh, we're going to read together in Luke chapter 21 um, and verse 7. Uh, hopefully it's on the screen. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these... Let's read it together. But when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed... Can, can we start again? You know, these are days when God wants us to be bold, okay? Some of you need to get over the fear of, of speaking out loud, all right? You know, if we, can't, if we can't be loud and bold here, you're not going to be bold out, out, outside there, amen? So let's start again, and let's read it out loud, because this is God's word, amen? Verse 7, so they asked him, saying, teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. And he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful signs and great signs from heaven. But when, before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. We will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle in your heart not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom by which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will be lost. By your patience, possess your souls." But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let not those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let not those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectations of those things that are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Amen. You may be seated. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. But when you see all these things, it says, lift up your heads. It doesn't say when you see all these things to tremble in fear. You know, the book of Timothy says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, 
and a sound mind. Amen. And so this, this series is very important because it's going to be addressing fear. And uh, because fear is a spirit, and Bible says God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. That doesn't mean that at times that you won't feel fear. But again, I think it's important for us to understand God wants us to be fearless. And here, the Bible speaking, or Christ speaking of the end times, addresses many of the signs of the times, many of these signs that are quite evident around us, uh, even in this current time. And, um, but you know, it's interesting... Here in, in verse, it says, uh, verse 26, man's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth. How many of you know, even in these last number of months, we have seen some things coming uh, and uh, many of them haven't been very good. And, and, and yet, the Bible says that in the end times, men's, men, men and women's, their hearts would be literally failing them from fear. And so, there's so much fear in the world today, whether it's fear of recession, fear of inflation, wars, natural disasters, climate change, pandemics, fear of food or fuel shortages. You know, the last two years, we had two years of project fear where grown adults were treated like children by their own governments. And to be honest, the disturbing thing was that some people seemed to actually like it. Some people liked spending a week in their jammies, week after week, being paid by the government to do nothing. And um, anyway, I'm not going to go there, but people began to accept some things as normal that were anything but. Churches and businesses being closed by government order, not being allowed to travel more than two kilometers from your home. Who would have ever thought we would have seen that in the Western world? Yes, places like North Korea, you know, China, etc. But, you know, it really was very, very shocking to see some of the things, you know, because this idea, you know, uh, not traveling two kilometers from your home, because how many of you know after two, two kilometers, the virus became more lethal? Or, or this idea that you could have three people, um, you know, at your table, but if you had four, that was now lethal, you know, and, and, and so it was this... Uh, but, you know, this is the thing. Fear is never based on logic. And so, uh, I think it was interesting, a recent article in the Daily Mail in the UK suggested that governments knew after a few months of lockdowns that they didn't work, and yet they doubled down on them anyway. Because they discovered that fear is an effective uh, method of controlling a populace and enforcing a narrative or an agenda or an ideology. And so, uh, this is the truth. Much of what we experienced over the last two years was not about a virus. And I'm, uh, I've been on record on numerous occasions. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in no way saying that, that COVID was a flu or anything like that. I understand it was very dangerous. Um, but again, I think for anybody who has a degree of discernment, I think you would be able to acknowledge that this was not about a virus. It, it was about something, uh, you know, much more malevolent. Uh, it, I believe it was about the furtherance of an agenda. And as Christians who know what Bible prophecy says, who know what the Bible has, has, has spoken, you know, thousands of years ago, we understand that it was an antichrist agenda. And uh, Revelation 13 and 15, I just want to set a little bit of a background, and I, I think the message will make more, more sense um, with this context. But Revelation 13 and 15, speaking of the antichrist, he causes all... It doesn't mean that all choose. It says he forces um, all. Uh, it says both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. So no one is exempt from this system. Um, and it says to receive a mark on the right hand or on the forehead that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark. And this is why cash has to go. Cash has to go. Because in order uh, for there to be a one world government with complete control over mankind, cash has to go because cash gives you a degree of anonymity. It gives you a degree of freedom. And um, once uh, currency becomes uh, digital, then it is uh, very easy to just press a button and all your cards are canceled. All of your means of buying or selling are canceled. 
And so, um, uh, anyway, it says that no one may buy or sell except the one who is the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who is understanding calculate the number of the beast. It's the number of a man. His number is 666. And so, uh, you know, one of the characteristics of the Antichrist kingdom, like I said, is control. And, um, you know, w w there seems to be one common denominator in many of the changes that we have seen um, over the last two years. I mean, if you think of how our societies have changed, even over the last five years, it truly is shocking to see the speed um, with which these changes have been implemented and in which um, so many people have embraced some really crazy ideas. And, um, but you know, there seems to be one common denominator in all of these changes, and that is the undermining or the complete abolition of uh, democratic rights and freedoms. Uh, because again, the, the, I think the irony of the Canadian uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, we say people kind, um, uh, of, of all people lamenting recently the slippage of democracy, as he called it, or of Western governments not adhering to their values. You know, and, and, and again, I, I have to ask myself, what values? You know, because we kill our unborn in the millions. And we, we no longer even know or want to acknowledge what a woman is anymore. And, um, and yes, these governments seem to try to present ourselves as the, as the, you know, those who carry the beacon for freedom and, and liberty. And, you know, this is the same prime minister who, who passed the Emergencies Act and literally froze the bank accounts of Canadian truckers who dare to question or push back against his restrictive COVID policies, even penalizing those who had supported them, uh, can, you know, freezing their bank accounts. And even to this very day in Canada, um, unvaccinated people cannot get on a train or a plane, either domestically or internationally. And, and so, again, you have these globalist leaders who decide they somehow have the right to reimagine democracy. And again, like I said, I don't care whether you've taken a vaccine or you haven't, but I think, you know, it's a fair enough proposition to say that, you know, it is your choice whether you take it or not. I mean, I don't think people should be taken at gunpoint and having, you know, something injected into them if they don't want it. Because, you know, I was under the impression that the whole idea of my body, my choice was gospel. But you see, they change it to suit themselves. To shoot, to, you know, the narrative suits uh, changes to, to, uh, to push whatever the agenda is. And so, anyway, uh, but, you know, it's this idea that, uh, you know, stay, so, stay home, uh, stay, stay safe. Uh, you know, to me, it's, it's this idea, you know, that we see of rulers, um, you know, looking at Canada or New Zealand or Australia or, or even parts of Europe. We, we have seen these rulers rise up who are acting more like despots than leaders of democratic nations. And, uh, and you might say, oh, Pastor John, don't be so political. This is not political. Freedom is not political. Freedom is a God-given right. So many Christians dismiss what I'm saying. Oh, oh, you're being political, pastor. No, I'm not. I'm being biblical. The Bible speaks about this. And if we do not, you know, if we do not care about freedom, it will be taken from us. And so, anyway, these are important issues. Um, and, and so, uh, when I look at those globalist leaders, many of whom are, are, are you know, uh, it's like they're all on the same page with, with, with their, their, their kind of attitude, their ideology, their, their approach. Um, you know, I, in, in some ways, I think they're symbolic of what we're going to face in the days to come. Rulers who take away rights in the name of keeping people safe, safe from intolerance, safe from bigotry, as they call it. But in reality, it's safe, keeping people safe from thinking for themselves. And, um, and, and, and so again, this is why I think we all need to limit the amount of time we spend on these things because they're really dumbing down our society. Uh, how many of you can say, you know what, uh, compared to five years ago, uh, you know, my attention span, particularly with regards to even reading a book, has lessened. How many can say that with honesty? 
I, I, I would say that I, I struggle with that myself. And, and, you know, so again, we have to just guard our hearts. And so anyway, we were told to stay home, stay safe, stay away from strangers, because they present a risk to your health. Stay away from your loved ones, particularly the elderly, because you don't want to be responsible for, for killing your grandmother. Um, uh, but you know, this idea of stay, stay home, stay safe, inferred that you know, going outside your front door was now reckless, that it was now dangerous. And, and so it was really about brainwashing to people to think differently um, and uh, to the point where people willingly submitted to becoming prisoners in their own homes and in their own heads. And fear became an ingrained part of people's thinking. And so, you know, part of this series is going to be addressing um, some of these bad habits that maybe some of us have developed over the last number of years where, you know, people have started to think, am I allowed to do X? Am I allowed to go beyond two kilometers of my home? Who would have ever thought that, in, you know, in a, a democratic society that we would have started thinking that way? So consider some of the recent headlines. Inflation, cost of living set to increase, food shortages, ration, possible rationing was on the paper this week, um, uh, possibility of famine, microchip shortages, oil shortages, fuel, electricity rises, possible new mutated deadly version of COVID found in China coming to a place near you soon. And on top of all that, the cherry on the cake, possibility of Armageddon World War III. And... Um, you know, what is the common denominator in so many of these headlines? Fear. You know, most newspapers and websites and news programs are literally filled with fear. But this book is filled with faith. This book is filled with faith. And if we were to be honest, the real virus we have been grappling with is fear. And, uh, and so, fear of lack, fear of hunger, fear of failure, fear of sickness... Fear of extinction, fear of living that is ultimately rooted in fear of dying. And let me say this, if you don't know Christ, you are not ready to die. But if you are born again, if you are washed in the blood, then you are ready to stand before your maker. And so, you know, Genesis chapter 3, the first thing we see that Adam and Eve did, and Eve did after they sinned was they hid from God. And the Lord God, uh, it says... Um, they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves. So the first time we see fear uh, present itself was after they had sinned in the garden. And it says they hid themselves. And uh, God said to Adam, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I command you should not eat? And um, so who, who told you, who you've been talking to, who you've been listening to? And the man said, the woman. <laughs> famous, famous last words. And for the last uh, thousands and thousands of years, men have been blaming women. Women have been blaming men. And nobody wants to take responsibility. But you see, fear originated in the garden through the fall. And so the word phobia comes from the Greek word phobos. And it literally means fear or horror. And so in reality, there are a huge number of phobias. Um, Aculophobia, which is fear of darkness. Um, acrophobia, fear of heights, completely understandable. Um, uh, agolophobia, fear of pain. Electrophobia, fear of chickens. <laughs> Chronophobia, fear of clocks. Gammaphobia. Fear of commitment. How many of you know some guys who have... <laughs> Genophobia. Anybody guess? Genophobia. Fear of knees. Some weird people out there. Um, Magirococophobia. Fear of cooking. I think my wife has that. Um, <laughs> Podophobia, fear of feet. Well, I've seen some feet and I think they should be kept inside. <laughs> Keep that animal inside its shoe. Um, pogonophobia, fear of beards. Um, <laughs> scolonophobia, fear of schools. You know, we laugh. 
We laugh because we can see how irrational fears can be. But you know what, for many people, this is how they live their life. Subject to fear, real or imagined, okay? Uh, Fears that end up limiting, defining, and sadly at times even destroying them, okay? But while this may be the way of the world, this is not the way of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 27 Jesus immediately said to them, be of good fear, be of good cheer. <laughs> Some, see, I'm just testing you. Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Uh, Mark chapter 5 and verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Mark chapter 6 and verse 50. When they saw him, they were troubled, but immediately he talked to them and said to them, Be of good cheer, do not be afraid. Uh, John chapter 6 and verse 20. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Why was the very first thing that Christ often did, um, you know, was rebuke fear, whether in his disciples or in the people to whom he was ministering? Well, I believe Christ, you know, the Bible says we have not a Savior who understands our weakness. You know, we have a Savior who understands our weakness. And so uh, Jesus said to fear not because he knew our tendency to both feel and be held captive by fear. Okay? And so none of us are exempt from this. And that's why he says fear not because it's a choice. Don't give in to Um, or give place to fear. Jesus was teaching his followers to feel the fear and do it anyway, as they say. Amen. And he showed us that that faith is a choice, not a feeling. And, And Christ was absolutely fearless in the face of Satan, sickness, and storms. You know, he was never afraid. He was never fearful. He was never intimidated by those who sought to criticize and control him. You know, Jesus was fearless in the face of the hungry multitudes in spite of their many physical and spiritual needs. Uh, You know, he he fearlessly declared the truth even though it endangered his life. Um, You know, Jesus, his boldness and his commitment to speaking truth put his life in jeopardy. But you may respond by saying, "But, but that's Jesus. But the Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Colossians 1, 27. Romans 1.17, for it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so if we live by faith, we die by unbelief. Every time you give in to unbelief, every time you give in to fear, you know, you are literally killing your destiny. And so if we live by faith, we die by unbelief. And so make your choice because, you know, let me say these are challenging and uncertain times. There's no doubt. But we are called to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And therefore, we must, we must walk in fearless faith. Okay, and that's what I want to address today is fearless faith. And to do that, I'd like to read chapter 17 of David and Goliath. I'm going to read it in the, uh, the Living Bible because it's quite uh, readable. Now, it's quite a lengthy passage, but I think it's worth reading. The Philistines now mu- mustered their army for battle and camped between Succoth and Judah and Azka. Um, Saul countered with a buildup of forces in the Elah Valley. So the Philistines and Israelis faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was a giant of a man, measuring over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, a 200-pound coat of mail, bronze leggings, and carried a bronze javelin several inches thick, tipped with a 25-pound iron spearhead, and his armor bearer walked ahead of him with a huge shield. He stood and shouted across to the Israelis, Do you need a whole army to settle this? I will represent the Philistines, and you choose someone to represent you, and we will settle this in single combat. (laughs) If your man is able to kill me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, then you must be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel. Send me a man who will fight with me. Goliath was very intimidating. (laughs) How many of you 
you know, we've all heard that voice. We've all heard that voice of intimidation. That voice that, you know, that wakes you in the middle of the night and starts to list all of the things that are going to go wrong in your life. All of the things that have gone wrong. You know, the devil is a liar, but he, he seeks to intimidate. And so Goliath was intimidating. He was loud. He was aggressive. And, you know, he was speaking down to them. When Saul and the men heard this, they were dismayed and frightened. David, the son of aging Jesse, a member of the tribe of Judah who lived in Bethlehem, had seven older sons. The three oldest, Eliab, Aminadab, and Shammah, had already volunteered for Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son and was on Saul's staff on a part-time basis. He went back and forth to Bethlehem to help his father with the sheep. For 40 days, twice a day, morning and evening, the Philistine giants strutted before the armies of Israel. So over 80 times, Goliath came and he stood in front of the Israelis and he, he intimidated them. He spoke down to them. He mocked them. And they stood there and they listened. And that's part of the problem. You must not listen to the voice of your giant. And uh, anyway, it says, one day... Jesse said to David, take this bushel of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread to your brother. Give this cheese to their captain and see how the boys are getting along and bring back a letter from them. Saul and the Israeli army were captive at the valley, camped at the valley of Elah. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and took off early the next morning with the gifts. He arrived at the outskirts of the camp just as the Israeli army were leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israeli and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. And you know, that's the way some of you may be today. It, it, it feels like you've re reached an impasse. You, you mightn't be going backwards, but you're not going forwards. You, you, you've come to a place, you know, whether it's a habit or some problem or some issue, and it's like there's this stalemate. And that's not the way God wants you to be. He wants you to move forward. And so I, I believe this, this passage is key for us to learn how to walk in fearless faith. And uh, anyway, it says, David left his luggage with a baggage officer and hurried to the ranks to find his brothers. You know, one characteristic we see in David was he was responsible. He was given responsibility and he took it seriously. He left his sheep with somebody minding them. You know, in all of the excitement of going to the battle, he might have just ran off and left them. He didn't. He left somebody minding his sheep. And here he brings the stuff and gives them to the baggage officer. And so I believe characteristic of, of leaders, the characteristic of people that God uses and blesses and anoints is they are responsible. I don't know how many times we've had people join a team. Two weeks later, you're like, where's Billy Bob gone? You know, you're there, you're early, you're faithful, you're dependable. That, that, that needs to become a habit in our lives, amen? Don't be the person who's always turning up to work late. Be a person who turns up early in Jesus' name, amen? So anyway, um, it, it says, he arrived at the outskirts of the camp just as the Israeli army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israeli and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. Uh, David left the luggage of the baggage officer, hurried to the ranks to find his brothers. As he was talking with them, he saw Goliath, the giant, step out from the Philistine troops and shout his challenge to the army of Israel. As soon as they saw him, the Israeli army began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The soldiers are asking. He's insulted the entire army of Israel. And have you heard about the huge reward the king has offered to anyone who kills him? And the king will give him one of his daughters for a wife and the whole family will be exempted from paying taxes. David talked to some others standing there to verify the report. What will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his insults to Israel, he asked them. Who is this heathen Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And he received the same reply as before. But when David's older brother Eliab heard David talking like this, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What are about those sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know what a cocky brat you are. You just want to see the battle. And again, you know what? This is why it's so important we learn to tune out the voices of intimidation. Sometimes it comes from the devil like Goliath. Other times it can come from people around us. Amen? And so we need to be discerning. And uh, anyway, what have I done now, David replied. I was only asking a question. And he worked over to, walked over to some others, asked the same thing, and received the same answer. When it was finally realized what David meant, someone told King Saul, and the king sent for him. 
Don't worry about a thing, David told him. I will take care of this Philistine. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. How can a kid like you fight with a man like him? You're only a boy, and he has been in the army since he was a boy. But David persisted. When I was taking care of my father's sheep, he said, and a lion or a bear came and grabs a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and take the lamb from its mouth. If it turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I've done this both to lions and bears, and I'll do it to this heathen Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who saved me from the claws and teeth of the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. Saul finally consulted, consented, Hallelujah. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. Saul should have been the one facing Goliath. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like and took them off again. Then he picked up five, five smooth stones from a stream and put them in a shepherd's bag and armed only with his shepherd's staff and a sling, started across to Goliath. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this nice little red-cheeked boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you've come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wine animals, Goliath yelled. David shouted in reply, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts of heaven and of Israel, the very God whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give uh, the dead uh, bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And Israel will learn that the Lord does not depend on weapons to fulfill his plans. He works without regard to human means. He will give you to us. As Goliath approached, David ran out to meet him and reaching into his shepherd's bag, took out a stone hurled it from his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and the man fell to the ground. So David conquered the Philistine giant with a sling and a stone. Since he had no sword, he ran over and pulled Goliath's from its sheath and killed him with it and then cut off his head. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, he turned and ran. I think it's very interesting that David went for a complete victory. He wasn't satisfied to see the giant fall. He got the sword and he cut its head off. And you know, sometimes we, we, we succeed to a degree in overcoming some sin or issue or bondage and, and we become satisfied with partial victory. God wants you to have complete victory. How many of you know when he cut the head off, that was it. It was finished. It was over. And that's the way we have to be with the devil. We have to be ruthless. Amen. And so when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the Israelis gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn all around the road to Sharim. Then the Israeli army returned and plundered the desert, the deserted Philistine camp. Later, Goliath took, Goli Later, David took Goliath's head to Jerusalem, but stored his armor in his tent. As Saul was watching David go out to fight Goliath, he asked Abner, the general of his army, Abner, what side of a family does this young fellow come from? I don't know. Well, find out. And uh, it says, after David had killed Goliath, Abner brought him to Saul with the Philistine's head still in his hand. Thank you, Jesus. So that was a very lengthy passage. I appreciate. But you know what? I believe it's worth reading. And um, so there's, there's a number of steps, I believe, uh, for us to develop uh, fearless faith. Amen. Um, you know, David is a perfect example of fearless faith. It, you know, it doesn't mean that he had nothing to fear. 
Clearly he did. He was facing a giant who was very skilled in the art of killing people. And, um, you know, the best warriors of Israel had already run from Goliath. And, you know, 40 days, 40 nights, they had listened to him as he threatened, as he mocked, as he insulted them. But unlike Saul and the men of Israel, David refused to allow fear to dictate his response. I'm sure that David felt fear, but he chose faith Anyway, amen? Because let me say this, everything that we desire is at the other side of fear, amen? Because fear stops us from stepping into our destiny. Fear makes us slaves. And as long as you allow fear to draw the boundaries of your destiny, you won't go very far. Okay, but fearless faith rises up on the inside. And just like in Numbers 13 declares, we are well able. Uh, you know, I was so blessed this week. We went to visit um, a, a precious family in this church. They were just after buying a new home. They were only in the home two weeks. You know, up to two weeks ago, they were still paying rent. But now they're living in this beautiful palatial home uh, over on the south side of Dublin. And um, it, it, I was just very inspired by their story because they didn't come from Ireland. They came from another nation and it didn't look like they, they were going to be able to buy a house. But they took a step of faith and, you know, they're in their new home today. And, uh, you know, let me say this. Faith is an act. Okay. Faith is an act. Uh, it's like Smith Wigglesworth once said, the book of Acts was only written because they acted. Okay. And so it takes faith to fall in love. It takes faith to buy a home. It, it takes faith to have children. It takes faith to believe in a better tomorrow. I, I feel sorry for these people who say, oh, I would never have children because look at the world they're coming into. I think that's a very, you know, a very sad outlook to, to, to take, you know, that the world is just only going to get worse. Um, you know, uh, maybe, maybe that child that you're going to have is going to be the one who makes all of the difference. You know, you look at history, David was the one who made all of the difference. You know, he was born into tough times. There was Philistines, you know, you know, ransacking the land. You know, you look in history and you see men and women who at a crucial time, you know, just like Esther, came to the kingdom for such a time as this. You know, I, 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 like I said, looking at history, um, you know, I, I, I thank God for so many men and women who at, at, at key moments uh, took a stand. You know, I, I, I think it was, uh, what was that Polish king who at the gates of Vienna de defeated the armies of Islam who had come to subjugate Europe to, to Islam as they had done all through the Middle East. You know, there was one king who took a stand, a uh, Polish king, king, what was his name, John? Shanshaki Chapigeski. <laughs> there you go. Praise God for him. Praise God that he's. I know I'm, I'm, I'm butchering your Polish. And it's, it's out there, okay? He was the king of Poland and he took a stand. And, and you know, uh, you think of Winston Churchill, World War II. I mean, it looked fate complete. The, the Nazis had taken over Europe and there was one man who dared to say, hell no. And so, again, there is something about God's divine design and purpose. Um, and, and, and so anyway, it takes faith uh, to believe in a better tomorrow. Because let me say this, anybody can, can you know, uh, anybody can hide in their basement watching Antichrist videos talking about how bad the world is getting. But that's not what we're called to. We're called to believe in a better tomorrow. We're called to, 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 to believe that, 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 you know what, God is not finished with us. And let me say this, life is for living. But well, you're not living truly if your faith isn't being stretched, okay? Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And I believe that's a word in season for every one of us. Because all of us over these last months have been feeling that fear. You know, even over the last number of years, seeing the changes in our world... But God says, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. Oh, but, but George Soros, oh, oh, but Klaus Schlaub. Listen, I don't care who these people are, what power they think they have. They are nothing. Our God sits on the throne. It is he who has the blueprints for our time and our existence. And it is his purposes that will prevail. Be strong, do not fear. Nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you, nor forsake you. 
Amen? And so God is with us, and we must include God in our plans. William Carey, the great British uh, missionary, he said this, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And so I'm going to very quickly go through a number of steps to fearless faith. And the first one is preparation. 2 Samuel 7 verse 8, New Living. Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pastures and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. The first thing we see in David's life was preparation. God prepared him in obscurity. You know, there would be a time when David would be revealed to Israel, but up until then, he was like St. Patrick, sitting on the side of a mountain, minding sheep. I'm sure it was probably a very lonely season in his life, but the psalmist of Israel used that time to pray and to seek the face of God and to worship God and also to practice his slingshot protecting his little sheep. You see, preparation time is never wasted time. And let me say this, some of you are being prepared for bigger things, things that you cannot even envisage at this present time, amen? You just don't know what it is. But you might say, but pastor, my life is hard right now. Well, you know what? You build muscles in the gym, not on a deck chair, okay? You train, you sweat, you eat right, you rest, you pay the price of preparation. And in the same way, you build your faith in secret on a daily basis when nobody is watching and nobody is applauding you and nobody sees you getting up in the early in the morning or late at night to pray or to study or to, to, to worship the Lord or to, to intercede. But you know what? God sees it and you're being prepared. Because let me say this, fearless faith doesn't just happen any more than six packs just appear. How many of you guys just woke up one morning, I've got a six pack, how cool is that? It doesn't happen, they don't just appear. I don't have one, so I'm not trying to boast. I'm just saying, some, I've seen, you know, I'm, okay. Uh, in theory, it's possible, but you don't wake up with them out of nowhere. So you pray for it, but then you pay for it by preparing for it. Amen? It's great to qualify for the Olympics, but anybody who's got there has endured years of grueling training. How many of you know consultants are well paid? Okay? But they have paid a price to get there. Try 20 years with no social life and very little sleep. You want to be married? Great. How about burning those pornography magazines and deleting those obscene pictures you have on your laptop? You want to get out of debt? Great, cancel your credit card and stop online shopping. <laughs> you want to have a baby? Prepare a room in your house. But I'm not married, okay, get married, okay? I'm just trying to, okay. Um, you have to prepare, but, but pastor, I look ridiculous. Listen, faith is an act. Prepare for there, wherever there may be, okay? You know, we bought a home, we bought a, a house, uh, we bought a bed for our new home, and it was about two years before we ever bought a home. But we, we bought it by faith, and it was sitting in, our, in, 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 Jill's, uh, in, in Jill's shed for about a year. It was sitting in the shop for about six months before that, you know, but you know what? We bought it by faith. And so faith is an act. Second Timothy uh, chapter 2 and verse 21. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Timothy 2, verse 21, and it says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Are you prepared? Are you prepared for there? Amen? Are you ready for your destiny? Don't expect to just walk into all that God has for you overnight. There is a process of preparation. Okay? Um, you know, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17 and verse 32 uh, talking about uh, David, and it says, um, uh, David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or bear came and took the lamb, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth, and it rose against me. I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. I mean, he's talking here about killing a bear, killing a lion. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine would be like one of them, seeing as he's defied the armies of the living God. You see, talk is cheap, but destiny will cost you. And, um, you know, preparation is painful, but it's unavoidable if you want to succeed. Um, uh, R.C. Ryle said this, a religion that costs nothing is worth nothing. 
A cheap Christianity without a cross will prove in the end a useless Christianity without a crown. You see, like I said, preparation is painful, but it's unavoidable if you want to succeed. You know, what if David had skipped the lion or the bear test the same way as some of you skip leg day if you go to the gym? He didn't skip it. He didn't skip the lion. He didn't skip the bear. And they were tests that God had given to him. But it was preparation for the moment when he would stand before a 10-foot giant with thousands of his own countrymen watching him. Okay? You see, God prepares us in secret for what he wants to do through us in public. You see, God sent the bear and the lion as a favor. It wasn't that God didn't love David. He was simply giving David a trial run. A trial run to deal with the pressure. How many of you are starting to look at your problems in a different light? God is just giving you an opportunity to stretch your faith and to believe. He wants to bring you to a new level of faith. But to do that, you have to stretch your faith. You know, Romans 1, 16 and 17 talks about how God is bringing us from glory to glory, from faith to faith. But pastor, it's painful to prepare. Yes. But you know what's even more painful than preparing? Failing. And if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. David had faced the lion and the bear before he got to Goliath. And so there was a process of preparation before promotion. And you know, the problem is this. The problem is some of you are trying to skip the process that God has for you. Amen. God has a preparation process for every one of us. You want to be a minister? Great. Where are you serving? What are you doing for God right now? No, no, you see, pastor, I'm looking for a ministry position, preferably well paid with a pension. You'll still be looking in 10 years time. Uh, Like I said, you know, John and myself, we did this for about 15 years, you know, without being paid. You know, this is uh, because we believe in what we're doing. and, And we understand that you don't get to where you want to be overnight. There's a process of, of, of getting there. There are no shortcuts um, uh, to preparation. Zechariah 4.10 in the Jubilee Bible says, For who has despised the day of small beginnings? Who has despised the day of You know, this is my fourth pulpit in my ministry of uh, uh, 20 odd years. Joanna laughs because she knows this is the first uh, pulpit we had that we actually bought. All of the other ones I, I made. Um, I think we have a picture of when I was a youth pastor. I gave it to Lynette there yesterday. Um, uh, and, and it was a little pulpit I had made. Um, if, if we have that picture, maybe. Uh, and so I, I was a youth pastor. And um, there was, uh, they had a bookshop. And there was some shelves that had been thrown out. And they were just in a little side room. And... Um, in my free time, I used to just go in there and try and put all these pieces together and to build this, this little pulpit, which is going to be up there any second now. And um, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Come on, guys, working there. No, okay. Well, it's going to be up there in a few minutes. Uh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So anyway, preparation is important. Um, and, and so, despise not the day of small beginnings. The reason I made it is, is we didn't have money for a, a pulpit. And um, even when we started the church, like I said, it was three times. The first time I did it was broken shelves. The other two times was pieces of metal that I found in skips um, in the process of my job. And I brought them home and just started putting them together. And the, the last one I had was really funny because it, it wasn't very well balanced. I had... Um, I had a slate off my roof on the, on the ground, which used to kind of try and weight it, but it used to fall, and, and it was glass, and it would just, it'd just go bang, and about three or four times it fell, the glass shattered everywhere after the service, and so the kids used to love running around, it was kind of a game, see if this thing's going to chop your leg off or not, um, but you know, most people are like Naaman, they miss the big picture because they're focused on the big opportunity. I don't have time to go through 2 Kings 5, I wish I did, but it, you know, there was a little servant girl who spoke to Naaman. You know, Naaman got offended because um, the prophet Elijah didn't come out and you know, speak some mighty words over him or acknowledge his greatness or uh, anything like that. You know, the prophet just sent his servant out and told him what to do, dip in the Jordan River seven times He got offended. He went off in a huff until his servant said, you know, if he'd asked you to do a great thing, would you not have done it? And so, like I said, sometimes we miss, 
you know, the, the big picture, like I said, because we want, we want the big opportunity. And so don't miss the miracle of the moment because of pride. And, um, you know, over the years, so many people have come up to me after the service asking to, to join the worship team. And, and that's fine. Uh, but you know what? They're not here three hours before the service starts setting the sound up. Because generally, Jason is in here from 8 o'clock in the morning setting all of this up. I, I just looking back at the piano. He's not at the piano. But I'm just saying, you know, th- 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 it's a package deal. You know, all of the worship team are in here probably from half 8 in the morning uh, setting all of this stuff up. And, you know, I think it'd be good to show your appreciation to them, amen? You see, there is a cost to the call. You know, the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen? And so, again, if we want to do this, in order to study, we have to focus. We have to deal with the distractions. Uh, Turn off your phone. Go to your room, go somewhere quiet and, and, and uh, before God and, and uh, you know, seek his face. Psalm 4 and verse 4, and it says, be angry, do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. You know, we need to learn how to be still before God. And so the shepherd is presented to Israel in a God moment. And what looks like an obstacle is actually an opportunity. David prevails over the giant and he is promoted. David prevails and is promoted because he is prepared. Amen. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. There is such a thing as a Kairos moment, a moment ordained by God. Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Are you prepared for your set time? Are you ready? Are you ready should that door open for you? So, you know, the first uh, one is preparation. The second one is conviction. Um, fearless faith is convicted. And, and it's so important that, that we are, uh, you know, people who follow our convictions. Preparation is so important. Are you prepared? Are, are you ready for what God has for you? Are you ready to step in? And, uh, you know, I, 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 I really feel sometimes we're so focused on where we want to go. And we miss completely the process that God has for us. And, and we're trying to do it in one step rather than in many. And, and so, like I said, I, I, I was hoping to do fearless faith as one part, but you know what, maybe we need to just take two weeks and just, there's a spirit that we need to deal with. Because I know there's people in this place and you've been waking up in the middle of the night, you know, with panic. You know, panic about, you know, possible food shortages, oil shortages, you know, inflation, you know, all the things that are going on and, and, and you're worried and you're dealing with fear. But you know what? The Bible says, do not fear. Jesus said over and over and over again, fear not for I'm with you. And there's a reason we don't have to give in to fear because the Bible says the Lord is with us wherever we go. And, you know, this is something that God showed me many years ago. Uh, you know, when I was just a, a, a kid in college, God showed me the importance of not giving in to fear. Amen. And that is Isaiah 41. And uh, let me just finish with, with, with a story and then we're going to pray. Um, you know, I was in college. I didn't have a lot of money. And I remember I had 10 pounds left and that was to buy my ticket back down to Kerry. And um, uh, I remember I was walking on O'Connell Street and the Lord just put it on my heart to give it to this lady. She was homeless and, uh, and just give it to her. And uh, I knew, you know, that was my ticket back home, uh, gone. But I remember I did it and uh, I, I just really believed God wanted me to stretch my faith. And so, so I did. I, I, I gave her the money and I walked home and said, okay, Lord, I'm trusting in you to get me back to Kerry. And um, I remember the night before I wrote this on a little brown envelope and it says, fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, from your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who are incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. 
You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, I will help you. How many of you know that God has your hand? Yes, we, we, yes these are, are challenging times, but God is by your side. The creator of the universe is with you. And let me say this, there is no recession or depression in heaven. There is no lack in heaven. I know we're being, you know, conditioned right now to start to accept, you know, not having money to pay for heating and not having money for food and, and, you know, all of these issues and problems, you know, that people are being, you know, trained. Uh, You know, I really believe there's some very dangerous agendas at play. I really believe that we need to be praying for America. There is a, there is an agenda to bring that nation down, you know, because in order for this agenda to go forth, I believe there are those who desire to destroy that, that nation. And, uh, but they're not going to prevail in Jesus' name. The devil is not going to prevail. He's not going to prevail. And so that day I started walking with my rucksack. I started walking down from Fibsburg. I walked through the city. I walked down towards Houston. Uh, I, I did not know how I was going to get home, but I was trusting God. I, I started walking along the road. I put my thumb out and I got a a lift from one side of the city uh, over to the other. And I remember standing on the, uh, out, out, out across from where Joel's uh, restaurant is there on the Long Mile Road, it's like four or five lanes of traffic. And I felt so small in that moment, standing. I didn't even have a, a little sign saying, Carrie. <laughs> I didn't think of that. But I had my little brown envelope. Fear not, for I'm with you. I felt very small at that moment. And, and some people they might think, that's not a big deal, you know, tell me back to carry. But for me, I'd never done it before. But I remember when I used to feel fear, I used to just pull out that envelope. Fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so I remember I just started speaking that to myself and fear, fear just left me. And you know what? I started getting lift after lift after lift. Some of them were just for 10 miles, 15 miles, 20 miles. But you know what? Bit by bit, I made my way down to Kerry. And I got there the same time as if I'd got off the train. And, and so I really believe God wants us in this season to learn how to resist fear. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We have to resist fear like we resist the devil because it is from the devil. We must learn to resist fear. We must learn to resist it. Amen. We must learn to choose faith and not fear. In Jesus' name.